in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you're welcome to another spirit filled message on fifty centric message if you're new to this channel I would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well I would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted unto you and then God is going to visit you your way thank you for watching worthy worthy is the lamb worthy worthy is the lamb worthy worthy is the lamb that was slain worthy worthy is the lamb worthy worthy is the lamb worthy worthy is the lamb that was slain. Praise him, hallelujah. Praise him, hallelujah. Praise him, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the power that was exerted when you raised Jesus from the dead. Today we stand victorious and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Be seated. Happy Easter to everyone. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'll be teaching tonight um, on a subject that relates to the season. We'll finish up our series um, at the nearest opportunity we have. But for now, we'll be looking at the doctrine of resurrection. The doctrine of resurrection. It's important for us to not only celebrate Easter, but understand the implication. Every time believers are bankrupt of understanding, our activities become a mere ritual that sustains no spiritual value, nor power to transform us. All over the world, at this time, believers are celebrating what they know to be Easter. And when you probe into the understanding of the average believer as to what they understand by this concept, you will find out that most believers have no idea. At best, they will tell you, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, I am free. Free from what they do not know. Why did he die? They do not know. And so we'll be looking very briefly and then we'll pray and we trust that God will grant us grace in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 6. We thank God for the showers of blessings. May it rain blessings on your life. In the name of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6, we begin our reading from verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of, number one, repentance from dead works, number two, faith towards God number three verse two of the doctrine of baptisms number four of laying on of hands and number five of the resurrection of the dead and then number six of eternal judgment so Paul is teaching us here that there is such a thing as the doctrine of resurrection in fact theologically speaking the major difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was their understanding as to the concept of the resurrection. One party believed that there's no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. 
Hallelujah. There is the doctrine of resurrection. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Apostle Paul was crying a prayer unto God and he said that I may know him. And among the many things he desired to know, even though he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he was attempting to describe the vastness and the depth that was contained in this revelation. He calls it the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection, that I may know him and that I may also know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Are we together? Write this down. Let me start with Easter. What is Easter? Easter is the commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in simple terms. Whenever we talk about and celebrate Easter, all across the Christian faith, we celebrate Christ, um, Easter now as the commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does it mean to commemorate? To commemorate means to observe. It means to mark. It means to show respect for. So when we commemorate Easter, we observe the mystery contained in that season. We mark it with understanding and then we show respect for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Let me define resurrection before I begin to teach. What does it mean to resurrect? What is resurrection? Resurrection comes from a Greek word called anastasis. Anastasis, let me spell it for you. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S -S. One more time. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. Anastasis. And it means raising up or standing up again. So from the root word, when we talk of resurrection, we mean a raising up or a standing up again. Something that was once standing and then it fell, became lifeless or lost its potency. Now when you engage it to a process that brings it up again, it's called resurrection, anastasis. Let me define it for you. Resurrection is an act or instance of a man's immortal spirit. Resurrection is an act or instance of a man's immortal spirit reuniting with the body. Resurrection is an act or instance of a man's immortal spirit reuniting with the body either the same body or a glorified body resurrection is an act or instance of a man's immortal spirit reuniting with the body it can be either the same body that he lost at the point of death or another kind of body higher in quality the Bible calls it a glorified body. Are we following tonight? That resurrection is an act or instance of a man's immortal spirit reuniting with the body. Either the same body or a different kind, a glorified body. Now write this down, please. Resurrection is a central doctrine of the Christian faith. Resurrection is a central doctrine of the Christian faith. We may differ. Now, just write and look up, please. All across the Christian circle, as we call it, we have the concept of denominationalism, where people seem to emphasize certain aspects of the Christian faith. We have what we call the Pentecostal, the charismatic movement. We have the evangelicals. We have 
you know, different sects here and there. But for as long as you call yourself a Christian, you may differ in other things like the ministry of the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. But resurrection, the doctrine of resurrection makes up a central part of the Christian faith and the Christian experience. It is important for us to understand this. That resurrection is a central doctrine of the Christian faith. Like we read in Hebrews chapter 6. And now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul himself gives us the doctrine of the resurrection from verse 11. This is the most concise exegesis of the doctrine of the revelation of the resurrection as revealed by apostle paul himself first corinthians 15 and verse 11 therefore whether it be i or they so we preached and so ye believe next verse it says now if christ be preached that he rose from the dead how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead he's dealing with an issue right now but if there be no resurrection of the dead remember i taught you that the pharisees and the sadducees were two major sects the sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead are we together it was the major point of difference between the pharisees and the sadducees but if there be no resurrection of the dead he said then christ is not risen next verse we're reading to 22 and if christ be not risen then our preaching then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain yeah and we are found false witnesses and we are found false witnesses of god because we have testified of god that he raised up christ whom he raised not up now he's speaking with respect to the thoughts of those who are fighting the idea of the resurrection whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not 16 for if the dead rise not then is not christ raised and if christ be not raised your faith is vain and ye have yet in your sins 18 it says then they also which are fallen asleep we're coming there now because you see the bible has an idea of what we have come to know and call death the bible in the pauline epistle calls dying in christ sleeping they also which are fallen asleep in christ are perished that means there's no hope of seeing them again then he says if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men most miserable verse 20 but now is Christ risen from the dead, hallelujah, and become the first fruit of them that slept. 21. For sins by man came death. Take note, take note. We're going to deal with some issues here. Sins by man came death. The Bible says by man came also the same resurrection of the dead. 22, the last verse. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. In the seminary, we will say, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Facts about resurrection. Right, please. There are two or three major facts that I would want to spell out immediately about the resurrection. Number one, the Bible teaches, please write, the Bible teaches that all men will experience resurrection the bible teaches that all men will experience resurrection two scriptures for that first point the first fact about resurrection that we must understand is that the bible teaches number one that all men will experience res resurrection acts chapter 24 please give us verse 14 and 15 But I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Making defense of the gospel now. 
believing all things that were written in the law and the prophets. Please, let's read verse 15 together. Ready? One, two, read. And having hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, uh -huh, both of the just and the unjust. The Bible clearly shows us that both the just and the unjust will experience resurrection. Others to be with God, others to eternal damnation. But the Bible teaches clearly that all men will experience resurrection. Revelation chapter 20, we'll read from verse 11. Is God giving someone understanding already? 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Next verse. And I saw the dead, is that in your Bible? Small and great stand before God. They were once dead, but all of them are now alive, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Next verse. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Is that in your Bible? And death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. Hmm. And they were judged every man according to their works. 14. And death and hell themselves were now cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says this is the second death. If we have the time, we'll have to look at the mere fact that the Bible acknowledges that there is a second death. It means there is a first one. This is the second death. Next verse. The last verse now, 15. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So point one, facts about resurrection. The Bible teaches that all men will experience resurrection. Fact number two, resurrection will always reunite the human spirit and his body. Resurrection will always reunite man's spirit and his body. Either the same body, like I said, or a new glorified body. Resurrection will always reunite. That means it will always involve a reunion of man's spirit and his body. The Bible teaches us that there are two dimensions as far as the bodies for resurrection is concerned. That it is possible for a spirit to return back to the same body it left. And then the spirit can also enter into another body. Two scriptures. One to establish the fact that a spirit can return back to the same body it left. In John 11 from verse 43 to 44. This was the story of Lazarus. And he said, John 11, 43 and 44. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Please read verse 44 if you can see it. Ready? One to read. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Lose him and let him go. So it is possible for a spirit to return back to the same body it left. Second example, stressing that point of same body, Luke 7 from verse 11 to 17. This was the story of a dear widow. The Bible calls her a widow who was in a city called Nain. And it came to pass the day after that when that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Next verse. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people in that city with her. Next verse. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. 14. 
and he came and touched the bear and they that bear him stood still and he said young man i say unto you arise next verse the bible says and he that was dead sat up and began to speak and he delivered him to his mother next verse we're reading to 17 and there came a fear upon all and they glorified god saying that's a that a great prophet is risen among us and that god had visited his people 17 now and this rumor of him went throughout all judea and throughout all the region round about so we see that in both instances the dead returned back to the bodies they had the, the bodies were quickened quickened means it was now made conducive for the spirit to now be able to inhabit it because you see medical science will tell you that when the spirit is detached from a body beyond a certain time that body begins to decay is that true and so both for lazarus and the widow's son even if the spirit wanted to come back the condition of the body because most likely the body left because something i mean the spirit left because something was wrong with the body so there had to be two miracles one the return of the spirit and the other the quickening of that body to now make it conducive for the spirit to return how about another body the bible teaches in first corinthians where we read let's start from verse 35 a continuation of our reading now first corinthians 15 from verse 35 media help us let's work together first corinthians 15 from verse 35 but some man will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come so this answers the question directly you are not a fool in jesus name he says thou fool he was talking to them now not you you have understanding that which thou sowest is it not quickened except it dies he's borrowing a phenomenon from agriculture now to teach them and that which thou sowest thou sowest not that body that shall be in other words when you throw your corn it is not the body that fell that will come out another body will come with it is that true it's amazing that the first of god's creation to witness resurrection was not even man it was plants that when you sow it will actually reap it goes through that process of resurrection remember that except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies jesus was teaching so back to our example it says that which thou sowest thou sowest not that body that shall be but bear grain it may chance um it may chance of wheat or some other grain my apologies for all this king james english but god giveth it a body as it had pleased him so god can give it another body and to every seed his own body 39 all flesh is not the same flesh are you see it now he's saying even among flesh bodies there are different kinds but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts another of fishes another of birds do you know what this means a human spirit cannot enter into the body of a fish it is not the normal way things should work that was why we need to pray and really examine what happened to nebuchadnezzar how he became an animal the force the spirit of a human being you see that it was a punishment it was not a miracle that god wanted to teach a man a lesson and he took a human spirit and put it in the body of a beast you know what that means many 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 parts components connected to his spirit will not function because the beast will not have the faculties to interact with some of those provisions that the spirit has so it's going to be a perpetual level of torture Forty. we're reading to 44 there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another 42 41 now 
there is the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars. And it says one star different from another in glory. 42 now. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Corruption means death doomed. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness for some. But it will be raised in power. 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And then he gives us an information. That there is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. For instance, the body you wear when you are in your dreams. It is a body, but it is not a natural body. Because your natural body is asleep in the room. Yet in the dream and the vision you have, you are not just a spirit floating. You are in another body. It says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So by these scriptures, we establish the fact that resurrection in its character will always bring a reunion between a spirit and a body. That immediately gives us a definition of death or a dimension of death. Separation. Separation, not just cessation of living, but separation between the spirit and the body. Fact number three. I'm giving us three facts. Number one, I said that the Bible teaches that all men will experience resurrection. Number two, resurrection will always unite man's spirit with his body either the same body or another kind number three it is impossible to fully understand resurrection and its significance to the believer until you understand four important concepts you cannot fully or it is impossible to fully understand resurrection and its significance. It is impossible to fully understand resurrection and its significance to the believer until you understand four important concepts. That means there are four important concepts that give us clarity and help us to really understand resurrection. Are you ready? Number one, sin. You cannot understand resurrection until you understand sin. Number two, you cannot understand resurrection until you understand death. Number three, let me slow down a bit. It is impossible to fully understand resurrection and its significance to the believer until you understand four important concepts. Let's take it again. Number one, sin. Number two, death number three the grave number four hell these are the four concepts that necessitate the idea of resurrection that means you can it is impossible to claim you understand resurrection as a mystery as a doctrine and its significance to the believer if you do not understand these four biblical concepts the entire journey of redemption, and that includes resurrection especially, are hinged on victory over these four factors. Number one, sin. Number two, death. Number three, the grave. Number four, hell. Unfortunately, I can't promise you that I will do justice to all tonight because of our time. This will require a series to pick one by one by one. We can spend a whole day talking on sin, another day talking on death, another day talking on the grave. Because this grave you see, is not just a hole that you enter. Are we together? For Apostle Paul to say, oh grave, where is your victory? Means it's not just talking of that pit that is dug. There is more to it. Let's see how far God will help us tonight. Lord, open my eyes. Grant me revelation. Please pray. Open my eyes in the name of Jesus Christ. Grant me revelation. Grant me revelation. 
the bible says when the mountain of the lord's house is exalted all people will flow to it and they will say come let us go to the house of god to the mountain of the god of jacob he said and he will teach us his ways in jesus name hallelujah you truly cannot comprehend resurrection and its significance to the believer until you know what sin is until you know what death is until you understand what the grave is and you understand hell because jesus passed through all four for resurrection to happen he became sin he died he was buried in the tomb he experienced the grave and he went to hell what is sin let's see how far we can go let's try to understand the four concepts what is sin first john chapter 3 and verse 4 let's try to touch a bit at least on the biblical concept of sin the bible says whosoever committed sin transgressed against the law for sin is the transgression of the law so according to this scripture the bible identifies sin as two principal things number one transgression number two rebellion please write for sake of time i'm summarizing my apologies sin is transgression of a command not just the old testament law that means for sin to happen there must be an instruction or a command it is not possible for sin to happen until there is something to violate are we together now the character the very nature of sin it must have an instruction or an order given to provide a basis for violating it sin is transgression sin is rebellion what does it mean to transgress to transgress means to violate to transgress means to go against when we talk of transgression we mean to violate and we mean to go against what then is rebellion i'm defining these terms because i do not want us to be in confusion in dealing with this i told you that sin is transgression sin is rebellion what is rebellion i wrote here the willful and continual resistance to constituted authority the willful and continual resistance to constituted authority now you understand what we call the original sin satan's sin his original sin was not just pride his original sin was rebellion willful and continual resistance to constituted authority now in theology there's what we call the original sin the original sin based on the law of first mention is in twofold there is the original sin as committed by lucifer and then as committed by man adam what is the original sin as committed by lucifer rebellion revelations 12 7 and 8 very simple lucifer's sin was rebellion that rebellion was sponsored by pride but what he acted out that we know to be seen was rebellion revelations 12 7 and 8 revelations 12 7 and 8 media please help us 12 7 and 8 let me turn it here very quickly for sake of time revelations chapter 12 from verse 7 and 8 it says and there was war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon there was war where for someone to dare to create war that is the height of rebellion there was war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not neither neither was their place found any more in heaven lucifer's sin was the sin of rebellion what, what what about man what was man's sin disobedience simple 
the sin of Adam and Eve was disobedience. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 17. That was where the instruction came that became the basis for obedience or sin. Are we together now? It's impossible to be obedient or to be sinful until there is a set order. Then you can now violate it. Until God spoke, it was impossible to obey or to sin. You have to understand, both sin and obedience is with respect to the word of God. Let me repeat myself again. Both sin and obedience is with respect to the word of God. God's word is the standard for measuring obedience and the standard for measuring sin. A violation to the word of God is called sin. Compliance and obedience to the word of God now is called faith or obedience as you call it. Is someone learning? Genesis 2.17. Here was the instruction from the lips of God himself. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, thou shalt not eat it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Take note of that statement. Do you know what surely means? Surely die means it's an ordinance. It will not change. You need to understand how powerful. Please, let me have your attention. You need to understand how powerful the word of God is. This is God speaking to man and giving him the first warning we see in scripture. He's saying, do not eat of this tree. For in the day you eat of it, something will happen to you. Thou shalt surely die. Now, let me surprise you. Do you know that it was God that introduced man to the concept of death? Satan was not here. The first mention of death and the first interaction of the concept of death was not given by Satan. It was God himself that said, listen, there is such a possibility called death and that the condition for that death, there is something you are going to activate if you transgress are we learning we'll come to death shortly it's just an information i wanted you to know so we see that for lucifer his sin was rebellion for man adam his sin was disobedience disobedience against the law of god genesis chapter 3 from verse 4 and 6 we see the outworking of that disobedience genesis 3 4 and 6 genesis chapter 3 from verse 4 and 6 let me read it and the serpent said unto the woman apologies for the projection and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die you see how satan we've, we've dealt with how satan works deception he's telling the woman don't mind god his word is not that powerful Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. He says, then shall your eyes be open, and you shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil. Now verse 6, he says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, and to make man wise, one wise. What did she do? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And the Bible says, also gave it to her husband with her. And he did eat. And something happened immediately. Now, God also helps us to understand his idea about death. That when God talks of death, primarily, he's talking about the spiritual state of the man. Because he said, in the day you eat, you will die. Biologically speaking and physically speaking, Adam lived hundreds of years afterwards before he now died physically. So he was not just talking of physical death. Are we together? Praise the name of the Lord. Theologically, Paul also helped us understand in his appalling exegesis about the idea of death. Paul told us that sin, sorry, 
that there is the nature of sin and there is the outworking of that nature what we call the acts of sin you may want to write that down that there is the nature of sin and there is the outworking of sin there is the nature of sin and there is the outworking of sin hallelujah In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, apologies again, I'm sure they are working on it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Please write it down, I'll quote it for sake of time. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. He never said he became a sinner. A sinner is one who gives room for the nature to find expression. But it says, he who knew no sin became sin that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 2. Ephesians 2 and verse 2. The Bible speaks about the spirit, the prince of the power of the air. He calls it the spirit that walks in the children of disobedience. So those who disobey, remember that another definition for sin is disobedience. That those who who disobey there is a spirit at work in them the spirit that walks in the sons or the children of disobedience for the sake of our discussion there are three very vital information about sin that i want us to get that connects to our teaching tonight please write it down three very important information about sin that we must get number one is found in romans chapter 3 and verse 23 it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory or the standard of God. That is the first information about sin that connects to resurrection. All, with no exception. In fact, the psalmist said, in iniquity did my mother conceive me. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Second information. Romans 6 23 are you writing Romans 6 23 the first one again it says all have seen 323 and the second information is that the wages of sin is death that means this sin has there is something that comes with it the wages the salary the payment of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. The third information, now this is very vital, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56. Ready? Let's read it together. One to read. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I'm interested in the first part. The sting of death is sin this is very powerful now so there is a relationship between sin and death it says the sting that means when sin strikes at you what happens as a result is death wow three most important information all have sin the wages of sin is death and the sting of death is sin Let's talk about death. I'm just helping to open us up to this concept before I now begin to tie the idea of the resurrection and then we'll pray. Is God helping us? The first mention of the word die or anything that relates to death, it came from the lips of God himself, Genesis 2, 17. Like we read earlier, Genesis 2, 17. He said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I told you earlier that the person who introduced the idea and the concept of death was God himself. I'm going to be saying a few things that would disturb you, but just pay attention and let's learn as we receive wisdom. Are you ready? Number one, death was not Satan's concept. Hmm. Death was not Satan's concept. 
Satan was not the one who brought the idea of death. No. Now, I've had so many teachings along the lines of redemption, the Pauline epistle, and many people have said, you know, Satan brought death. Um, it's, it's not very accurate. Doctrinally, death was not Satan's concept. Are we together? I want you to know that death was also created. Death was... <laughs> death was also created but death did not have the power to kill listen carefully now death as you know it now was not God's design death was not supposed to be an instrument that you use to kill uh -uh. someone changed that operation and made it so Number one, death was not Satan's concept. Number two, death was not created to have the power to kill. God never gave death the power to kill. So where did it get his power from? I will tell you. The power of death to be able to kill came from man listen carefully the power of death to be able to kill it was man that gave death the power to be able to kill and the basis for that power watch this now by the original sin of man satan tricked him to activate something and empower death to now be able to kill. Listen carefully. And because of that violation and that statement that God made, that every time there is sin, death should have the freedom to strike the sinner. Are you getting the point now? God gave man an instruction and he said your immunity, there's no record of death threatening man in the Garden of Eden. No. Death only derived its power at the instance of sin. Something happened to man when he violated the principles and the instructions of God. From that time, and then empowered by God's own verdict. Everywhere death sees sin, it has the power to kill the individual. Are you learning now? Pay attention, you will understand. That everywhere upon any human being at all, if death finds sin in that person's nature, death has the authority to come and create a separation between his spirit and his body. Ultimately, destroying the location of his spirit and disrupting that possibility from dwelling with God forever. It was not God that empowered death to kill. The power of death to kill was because of the presence of sin that came through man. Are you getting now? Man's disobedience gave death the power to kill. Please write it down. Man's disobedience gave death the power to kill that means without sin death has no power over man as seen in the garden without sin death has no power over man you have to understand this concept to now begin to understand what jesus did when he walked upon the earth without sin death has no power over man let's discuss the power of death 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 55. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Apostle Paul now. Oh death, where is your sting? He's making a mockery of death here based on a revelation. 
The same way Elijah made a mockery of the prophets. This is a mockery he's making of death. O oh, death, where is thy sting, he says. And O oh, grave, where is thy victory? It means that there is something that he understood about the sacrifice of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Write this down. The key to ultimately destroying death is for sin to be completely absent in the human race. The key to ultimately destroying the power of death, if you want, is for sin to be completely absent in the human race. Hmm. This is very powerful. The key to ultimately destroying death or the power of death is for sin to be completely absent in the human race. Look up. Let me teach you something. This thing called sin, more than an act, is a nature. And based on the deception of Satan and something about the way God created the system, that sin passes through the blood. Are we together? So, as a woman is pregnant, that baby in her womb already carries the nature of sin. So the baby also carries the possibility of dying, even though he had not been born. Are we together now? Death has a mandate by reason of the fall of man. And the mandate and the condition is anywhere you see sin, whether sin as a nature through the bloodline or sin as acted out by the physical body, you are authorized to take that individual. And from the fall of Adam, death effortlessly was able to take people because he found out that there, there was no exception as far as the absence of sin is concerned. That even the most righteous person had within his nature by blood. Are we together now? So we became slaves to death. Now, when you understand this concept of death, you will now begin to appreciate what happened with the coming of Jesus right from his birth. Are you seeing the reason now why a man, a mortal man, did not play the role in Jesus' coming? Because remember, the seed is transferred through the man. The woman only receives. Are we together now? And if a mortal man played that role, then Jesus would not be able to save sinners because he himself would be in need of a savior. That's why the Holy Ghost played that fatherly role. Because biology teaches us that the blood from a child comes from his father. Is that true? Now, this young boy grows to become an adult and something very strange happened from the time he was announced. Satan found out that all over the earth there was only one person who stood as human even though he was God and when he came to him he found exactly what he saw before he attacked Adam. How did this happen? That this person, there was no nature of sin. He says, Satan, come to me. Understand the process that leads to redemption now. Are we together now? Don't think death tried Jesus, but there was no basis. Remember the rule. The law is that you can only use the power to kill when you find the nature of sin in that individual. Now, death came to Jesus once and again, and it had no power over him. The same way it had no power over Adam before the fall. What was the crime? The crime was that Jesus could not die. Why? Because he did not have the nature of sin. That meant there was no possibility for him to go to hell. Because the only person who can go to hell is the person who death kills.
Just, just take it easy. You are going to understand what I'm teaching you now. <laughs> oh, death, where is your sting? The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. So, if Jesus walked upon the earth and did not go to heaven till now, he would not die. Nothing would be able to touch him because that nature was not in him. Death will pass him like this. He will pass death because the nature that authorizes the operation of death. Jesus did not come from Adam. No. Everyone who came directly from Adam was already subject to death. First and most important, spiritual death. Then the physical deterioration that happened by reason of the reign of death over a long period of time. Are we learning now? There was no way Jesus would have saved man as being sinless because there was no way he would be able to go to the grave. And remember, the problem was he came not to die for himself. He was not the one who had any problem. The problem was man, and these four elements needed to be dealt with. Number one, sin. Number two, talk to me. Number three, the grave. Number four, that means he had to assume a position that would qualify him to pass through all four. But as he was sinless, sin would not be able to touch him. Death would not be able to take him. The grave would not be able to take him. And hell, they, they, because they are all related. It is sin that leads to death. Death takes you to the grave. Grave takes you to Hades, the place of the dead. Now he came as the sinless one. And death would try and say, I cannot find what gives me the authorization. Because sin, the nature, is what gives me the authorization to destroy the human spirit. Satan cometh to me, the Bible says, and he does not find anything. But... Because his agenda was to come and save us. The Bible says we did our best and death still took us effortlessly. So the only way people were preserved from death in the Old Testament was through covenants. God would have an agreement with them and give them terms. So they will obey those terms. And on account of those terms, they would have an immunity against death till the assignment was over. But that permanent victory over death, it was not possible. Now you will know who Jesus is. And you will know what he did when he came. Follow the story now. When Jesus left heaven, watch this. Remember the instruction in Genesis 2.17. He told man, the instruction was given to who? Help me, man. The instruction was not given to angels. The instruction was not given to lower creatures. The instruction was given to man. In the day that you eat of that fruit, in the day you walk in disobedience, something will happen to you. And he spoke to man. He said, you shall surely die. That means the moment you violate that, there is no possibility of reconnecting with me at this level again. And so, if God were to punish anyone, it would be man. That's why Jesus had to now become a man. He couldn't save man as God. God does not sin. God does not die. God does not go to the grave. And God does not go to hell. This is for men. And so he became a man. But this time around, he came as a sinless man. It was a mystery that men did not understand. Angels did not understand. Even his apostles did not understand. So he walked upon the earth. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus, the son of the living God, was sinless. And I hope that you know that sin does not just affect the body. God's focus in dealing with the sin problem is not just the body. Because in any case, like you will be learning, this body is just a container. The real thing is your spirit. 
are we together now now let me teach you something very powerful and then we'll find somewhere to pray hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 hebrews chapter 4 for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity it says but in all ways tempted like us yet without sin that means death kept coming to look around how do i get this man but because there was no sin not in his nature death could not touch him are you seeing why the moment he became seen he didn't spend up to three days death took him immediately because he had been looking for him and it's like you've been searching for something and finally you found it it was like a dream come true this sinless man what gave him that authorization he had now become seen with speed death took him only to watch the shock that paul gave us that will happen in hell because jesus had to look for a way to get down there and in this condition he would never be able to die he would never be able to go to the grave and remember everything he was doing was for me and for you are we together so to qualify jesus christ based on all i have taught you now to qualify jesus to die he had to become sin and there was no way of carrying the human blood because the idea of sin is not just physical blood transfusion no there was no way you could reverse the process of making a human male become his father again joseph was just a caretaker it was the holy ghost that played his father the role so he now introduced a concept like i've taught you called the holy communion because the bible says he became sin how did he become sin john chapter 6 john chapter 6 i'll begin my reading from verse 53 john 6 53 then jesus said unto them verily verily i say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the son of man pay attention and drink his blood you have no life in you are you seeing this now this is a very powerful concept next verse who so eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood had eternal life and the possibility of resurrection can happen to that person this is what jesus was teaching he's saying listen in this your state if you die that's the end of it for you but there is something i want to do i want to make something happen to you such that resurrection can be possible for you are we together that i will raise him up on the last day 55 for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed 56 now he that eateth my flesh this is the key verse now and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and i in him i've taught you this right the doctrine of interpenetration the mystery by which two entities become one that's the same mystery by which a man and a woman from different locations parents now are called one it's what brings one plus one equal to one jesus is teaching them here that it is possible for me to enter you and you enter me Are we together? Please help those under the anointing. So, when they were taking the communion, let me tell you what they were doing. Remember, according to scripture, it took eating or interacting to partake of that nature of sin. Now, it had to do with a meal. Something was happening. The disciples did not even know what they were doing. Follow carefully now as we unravel the mystery that leads to the resurrection he broke the bread which he said was him he said all of you eat it you are not just eating it for yourself you are representing men i can't gather the whole world in a meeting but i can use the number 12 because 12 is a covenant number for government you are representing the entire human race listen carefully in this communion so when they ate it he now said one more drink this cup this is my blood 
The moment that happened, Jesus said, all right, thank you. You will see me shortly. He was on his way to Gethsemane. They didn't even know what he went to do. He now said, Father, based on this mystery called the communion, it is legal for me now. I have made myself one with man. That means I can transfer the sin. Whether I transfer my righteousness to him or sin is transferred to me. Remember the mystery now. Remember in marriage, when a woman marries a man, she doesn't have to look like him. She now carries his son name immediately. Now he sat at the communion. And what was happening is that man was giving him authority because the earth belongs to man. And he came, even though he was God, he was man. He had to find a way to negotiate with men to give him a legal basis to carry their sin so that death will now look for him. Now watch this. Please watch this. Look up, please. Let me tell you what Satan and demons saw in the realm of the spirit. They only knew that there was a meeting going on in the upper room. I hope you know that's where the last supper too happened. And as soon as Jesus came out, Satan saw that this is not the same person they had always seen. What was changing? Something was happening to him. That thing Satan sees in every human being, he finally saw it on Jesus. When Jesus went to Gethsemane, most people thought he just went to pray. No, something was happening there. You know what was happening there? It was right there the Holy Ghost had to leave him. Because the Bible calls him the second Adam. And the Holy Spirit, who was a life-giving spirit, when the Holy Spirit lives in him, Satan, life and death, light and darkness cannot dwell. So when he said, take this cup off me, the cup was not dying on the cross. For the first time, the Holy Ghost will have to leave him to suffer alone, the same way he left Adam. You see now. Listen carefully. So right from Gethsemane, he was no longer Jesus Christ. No, he was now the man, the second Adam. So Judas comes, and Judas does not even know what is possessing him. And Satan looks at Jesus and said, something changed. I'm sure in his mind he will say, who tempted you that you became sinful, this cheap? Not knowing that it's called the hidden wisdom of God. So now, that once invisible deity now gave himself freely. That was why when they caught him all together, the disciples thought he would shake them and throw them. But now it seems like he was just a weak person. And they took him around. Satan could not believe it. What in the world? I, I knew that I may defeat him, but this is the son of God. What I could not do in heaven is now happening cheaply. I was cast down because of this agenda. Somebody is going to bow to me. And Jesus kept going like a sheep to the slaughter. Now, condition one had been met. He had become sin. Automatically, death now had the authority. Are you seeing now? So Satan started moving through Pontius Pilate and through all. Look at how Satan was determined. Do you know what it means for a whole city to suddenly hate you? That's hard work from the realm of the spirit. Satan was making sure that nobody shows any mercy. Now that this guy is seen, I don't know what else he can do. Let me kill him fast. Because Satan did not know that if you resurrect, listen, the idea, he had seen resurrection. But the way resurrection happens is that somebody in the earth realm must call you. Are we together now? He must call your spirit back into your body. And Satan knew that if Jesus left, nobody, nobody. So Jesus was led and death was doing to him what he did to Adam. When he hung upon that cross, condition number two, the second element, he had become sin. And he died. Hmm. You know what happened? Imagine the silence in heaven. Because the angels did not understand this. They were just obeying instructions given to them. What in the world is this? God, you turned your face on the Son of God. 
and now he died hell was rejoicing and his body was hung there Joseph of Arimathea said please don't leave this body here he didn't know what was moving him to ask because the third element was about to be conquered the grave now the issue of sin he had become sin now he had, ah my god he had died and when they took him to that tomb and kept him there they rolled the stone and they closed it physical realm you are done with your own assignment now let's see what happens let me tell you this because you see the bible does not and I've read my Bible. I don't mean to argue this, but I know from the authority of Scripture, with the exception of two people who were still even learning about them, Enoch and Elijah, the Bible does not record that anybody before Jesus Christ died directly and went to heaven where the Father is and stayed there. You will not find it in your Bible. No. No. The Bible says they died with a promise that something will happen. Because throughout their lifetime, they obeyed the instruction that was given to them. So it was taken as a token of righteousness. And they say, you wait here. A day will come, something will happen that will make reference to your obedience. And it will bail you out. Now Jesus is about to visit the third element. The grave. When he was done with the grave. Let me tell you what the grave is. Number one. The grave is a place where I wrote here, the physical remains of a deceased is deposited. Could be a ditch, could be a pit. Physically speaking now, a grave is where the physical remains of a deceased person is deposited. But the spiritual meaning of a grave, listen carefully, a grave is a spiritual passage. A grave is a spiritual passage from the physical realm into the realm of the spirit. It's a doorway that leads from the physical realm to the physical to the spiritual realm. Number three, the grave is also where resurrection begins. Very important information about the grave. The grave starts resurrection starts right at the grave Lazarus woke up from the grave before he came out so a place where the physical remains of a deceased is deposited a passageway from the realm of the spirit to from the physical realm to the realm of the spirit are we together the grave now the fourth element I want us to look at very quickly is hell. There are seven words, seven Greek expressions of the word hell. But there are two that are most important for our discussion. One is called Gehenna. Gehenna is spelled G-E-H-E-N-N-A. And Gehenna was not a spiritual place. It was a physical understanding. Gehenna in ancient times outside of Jerusalem when you study Bible history there was a place where they set criminals on fire and they would burn them and throw their dead bodies you understand we see a, an example of that in most cities there are places where you see them heap rubbles and they can set it on fire that was where they called they called it hell but it was Gehenna they would burn um, criminals set them to ashes and then throw their bodies there you know to rot and decay and so on and so forth but there is another word called Hades, H-A-D-E-S. Hades is called the place of the dead. Hades, the place of the dead. Psalm 16 and verse 10. Psalm 16 and verse 10. Psalm 16 and verse 10. For thou will not leave my soul in hell. The psalmist was speaking prophetically about the things that would happen. Neither will thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. The word hell there is the word Hades. Second scripture, 
Psalm 139 and verse 8. Psalm 139 and verse 8. He was speaking and said, where can I hide from your presence? And he said, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I descend to, the, to hell, the word there again is Hades, the place of the dead. Thou art there. So we know that there is a place called the place of the dead. So Jesus died. Where do you think he went to? He could not have gone to heaven. Because anybody carrying the nature of sin cannot go to heaven. In fact, anyone who has not been redeemed cannot go to heaven. And until Jesus came, there was nobody who had enjoyed the blessings of redemption to go to heaven. Otherwise, the Bible would never call him the firstborn among the begotten. He had to be the person to lead that way. Are we together now? So Jesus went to hell. My apologies. I don't know what is um, affecting the whole projection. But let me read Hebrews chapter 2. Let me use my Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 14. Hebrews 2, 14. I'll read it, just listen. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. This is verse 14 now, Hebrews 2, 14. He also himself likewise took part of the same. Took part of the same means he became in their form, spiritually now. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them, 15 now, who through fear of death have all their lifetime been subject to bondage. So all that Jesus did was so that he will finally go to the place of the dead, the realm of the spirit, and correct something that happened between Satan and the first man. Let's see what happened now. So, the gate that opens up the physical realm to the spiritual realm opened for Jesus. And the Bible says, my God, Paul was such an intelligent man. This was how this guy just sat down home and he was just watching it like a video and now began to write it. You know what happened? The Bible says, when Jesus was going to go and join all those who had gone before him now, while he went there, he was in hell and something began to happen seriously there. Satan was shocked to find out that although Jesus was there, he now tried to force him to bow. Listen carefully. Bowing talks of acknowledging authority. Are we together now? Yes. Jesus now went in the strength of man, Adam. And all the cohorts of hell were forcing him to bow to the authority of Satan. Paul said that he made a public show of them. Now, hold on. Let me explain to you what that means. Remember, Jesus said, in the day you eat it, you shall surely die. That means God's word should not fall to the ground. Every man should die. Do you know what that means? It doesn't mean to stop living physically. It means there is no possibility for man to be connected to him again. So Jesus now comes representing the entire creation in that covenant. And went through the punishment that man should go through. And the Bible says he shall see the travail of his soul. This was a revelation given to Isaiah the prophet. That he shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. According to the teachings of great men like E.W. Kenyon. He now says when the legal claims of justice was now paid for. You see that now. The father's heart was satisfied. Jesus made a public show of them. He says triumphing over them in it. Now the final battle. He goes to Satan, who the Bible called the God of this world. 
who had collected the keys of dominion from Adam through deception and Jesus collected that key and Apostle Peter teaches us that he now went somewhere that is called the bosom of Abraham because the, the bosom of Abraham is not heaven. Oh, I hope you know that. Hmm. There's no such place called the bosom of Abraham in heaven. Mm -mm. There is a throne. The Bible describes about 12 or 13 things that we know and see in heaven. The bosom of Abraham is not there. Apostle Peter said Jesus went there and preached the gospel to them. And they believed. What was the gospel? Listen, I'm here with you now. Remember the promise he made to you through Abraham that in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He was not talking of money. He was saying, Abraham, because of your covenant, the Jewish nation will come out and Jesus will come out of that nation and whoever believes, just like you believe, it will be credited to him for righteousness. That promise, I have come. Do you believe? They said, we believe. He said, come, follow me. And that was how they started going out. It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. After the defeat that happened in hell, Jesus led captivity. John, give me Ephesians, my spirit is fired up. Ah, yeah. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Let's start from verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4. Did I get that right? Ephesians 4 from verse, um, he led captivity captive. Help me. Look for it for us, media. It should be helping me as I'm preaching. Ephesians. Let me pull it up. He led captivity captive and he gave gift unto men. Verse 8. Thank you. Ephesians 4 and verse 8. Wherefore saith he, when he ascended up on high, he did what? He led captivity captive. In fact, let's go to verse 6. Let's start from there. One God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, verse 7, pay attention. It says, but unto everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Uh -huh. Wherefore he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And gave gifts to men. Verse 9. Powerful information now. Now, he that ascended, but what is it that he also descended first to the what? Lower parts of the earth. So Jesus went there. He's describing it now. Verse 10. And he descended, and then when he was done, he now came to the earth. He ascended. To finish his high priestly duty and then he came to charge the disciples this is the protocol that's what happened so he came out and the bible your bible says that when jesus was done now the issue of sin death the grave hell was about to be do you know that if jesus did not resurrect that means that number one Death still had power because the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that also means that he's not exerted power over death, over Satan. It means that he was trapped in hell. So the Bible says on the third day, let me hurry up, by the authority of the Father, resurrection. When he resurrected first, the Bible did not say he resurrected alone. The departed saints that they resurrected with him and walked around the streets of Jerusalem and all men saw them. Are we together now? All men saw them. Now, when Jesus resurrected, I'm hurrying up because of time. The Bible tells us that Mary saw him and she wanted to come and touch him. She said, Rabboni, he said, don't touch me. That means I'm not yet done with my, I just came out of the grave, but there is something I need to settle. He now went to heaven. Paul was shown this when he taught the Hebrew church, that Jesus now went to heaven. He was no longer a savior in heaven. He was a high priest and the lamb. He carried his blood into that tabernacle. 
are we together i've taught you and now poured that blood upon the altar to atone for the sin of man once and for all the moment he finished listen carefully the moment he finished triumphantly a coronation service was held in heaven for him the lord said to my lord sit down at my right hand until i make your enemies your footstool philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 now let this mind be in you please give it to us which was also in christ jesus verse 6 it says that although being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but for your sake and my sake verse 7 he made himself of no reputation took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men verse 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became what obedient to death think about it obedient not obedient to the father obedient to death is another word of saying he became sin because whoever has that nature of sin is a slave to death he became obedient to death even the death on the cross verse 9 wherefore god had so highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name at the resurrection of jesus watch this now a coronation service was held for him and when that coronation service was held that was when he was given the name lord l o r d now but the advantage is that he was not lord alone he was not king alone remember our communion mystery that everything he was doing you were doing it in him that's the part satan did not know because if all of us were to be saved every one of us will have to do what jesus did for ourselves and jesus went through all that and when he resurrected by the glory of the father satan was surprised because he found out now listen carefully he found out that there was a possibility that had come from the resurrection that man would not be able to have what was that possibility that because jesus rose again man is not only saved but man also will rise like him not just spiritually first like arising from the dead but that physically every time you receive eternal life into your spirit there are many things that you receive number one is the life of god but number two you receive something called the power of resurrection the power of resurrection part of it is for this age but part of it will be activated when the trumpet sounds follow me carefully we're discussing the doctrine of resurrection now there is a part of the power of resurrection that is in us but is not yet activated it will be activated the moment the sound of the trumpet is the signal that was given that the moment that sound comes everyone whether you are alive or you are dead in christ that software becomes activated and every the grave no matter where you died you must resurrect once you are in christ honor will be given to those who died in christ first we call this sleeping and then we who are alive and remain together will be caught up with him paul said that i may know him and the power of his resurrection let me tie up one or two things listen carefully there is a law according to hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 that it is appointed unto man to die once why is it appointed to man to die because of the original sin of man even though you are saved spiritually unfortunately this physical body still carries with it that nature of sin and that is the reason why deterioration are we together now and all these other things that happen to man now your spirit will never never have to be separated with god again because you have received jesus that oneness that union a reversal of what happened to adam but listen carefully it is appointed unto men please leave that scripture hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 
wants to die. Everybody say it is appointed. It's not what you chose. It's an appointment. And it is appointed unto man to die once. But after this, that means death is not the end of all things. Listen carefully. That though our outward man perish, Paul said, but that there is something happening to our spirit man and that the real concern for the believer, understand resurrection now, is not so much your body. Paul is saying, look, relative to what has really happened to you, the physical body is not so much the issue. No matter how long you wait, it is still appointed unto all men to die once. You may ask a question and say, Apostle, but how about Enoch and Elijah? These are two men that the Bible does not record that they died. Listen to me. Hear me. I assure you, I don't want to go into eschatology now, but all of them will still taste death. It is appointed unto man to die once. The question is, what is this death that he's talking about? Does it mean to get to a point where your body lies down? No. It is appointed unto all men, listen carefully, that there will be an event in their life when the spirit will be separated with this body. If it happens earlier through what you call natural death or at the blast of the trumpet, the Bible says this is not the body that will carry this spirit. It will still be changed within a moment, a twinkling of an eye. There are people who are not going to die physically. They will not enter the grave. However, they will still taste of that event with that change that happens. Are you getting what I'm saying now? This is very powerful. It is appointed unto men to die once. When Jesus returns, he's not going to find an empty earth. There will still be people there. But those who are alive physically and those who have gone before us, the Bible says honor will be given to them to rise up first, resurrection. And the possibility of that resurrection is because Jesus now led the way. And because we were in him when he died, if he resurrected, there is authorization for us to also resurrect. Are we together? Jesus could go to Hades because death could now kill him. He went there when he paid the price of justice, he resurrected by the power of God. He conquered the grave, he conquered sin, he conquered death, and with that victory, he now handed it to the believer. Listen carefully. So the completion of the entire journey of redemption is not just giving your life to Jesus. It's also understanding that one day, one day that you have defeated death both spiritually and physically and that even if your outward man is ever shed away for your spirit to live you find hope because even though you die to die in christ means that that software was still in your spirit and that when the signal of the trumpet comes another body will be given to you and that spirit will return back that means everybody who died in Christ, we will still have that glorious reunion, the resurrection. Now, let me teach you another very powerful concept. Jesus himself was teaching. John chapter 11 and verse 25. Jesus said resurrection is a person, not just an event. The woman he was talking to was saying, I know, they've taught us in the temple that at the last day there will be such and such a resurrection. Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He said, he that believeth in me, read it please, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What is this that Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, even though I have conquered death and hell with respect to your mortal body, listen carefully, it is still possible that this body can transit. And he teaches us in his Pauline epistles that you never call a believer's transition death. You call it what? The idea of sleeping is that that person is not lost. He's going to wake up. 
Even if he slept in 1904, it's just a long sleep. He will wake up again. This is what the Bible calls the blessed hope. The blessed hope is the hope of resurrection. Not just the hope of conquering sin and Satan, whatever it is. So as we sojourn in this life, as we celebrate Easter, on one hand, we thank God for the victory that we now enjoy in this life. But there is a blessed hope. You know what that hope is? That no matter what happens, whether in life, or in death, we have already received that software that makes for resurrection. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll discuss one mystery and then we'll begin to pray. First Thessalonians, please, chapter 4. Paul began to teach us himself about the idea. From verse 13, we're reading 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Okay. But I would not have you ignorant. Say knowledge. Paul wants to give us knowledge. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are what? Are you seeing that Paul uses a term sleep? Please let me encourage you here. Every time you stand before a dead body, of someone who received Jesus Christ in his lifetime, I want you to know that you are simply looking at the remains. The remains. That body you see will be replaced by another body. It does not matter how it was battered. It does not matter what happened. That body, will, you will be given another body. And the Bible says that person is only sleeping. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which do not have hope. 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, everybody say died and rose again. One more time, say died and rose again. Your gospel must never end with Jesus dying alone. The resurrection and his exaltation at the right hand of the Father is what completes the gospel. Even so, because of that, them which also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 15. He now teaches us this is what will happen. This I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that which which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now notice how Paul is saying asleep, asleep. 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. He's explaining it now. Shall rise first, not only first. 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. The word caught up together is the word that we know to now to be rapture. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is what Jesus died to achieve. That eternal separation. Notice the Bible does not talk about heaven here. It says be with the Lord. The location is not the important thing. It is the person. We will be caught up in the air and we will be with the Lord. Where I am, there you may be also. Because you will be learning that heaven is not the only place God stays. There is something called a new Jerusalem and he's coming back to the recreated earth. And when he comes back because of that covenant of oneness, wherever he is, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. If I resurrect you, you will be with me. Everywhere I am, there you will be also. Can I tell you this? A day is going to come on earth. Look at me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure it will not be very long from now. We will wake up one morning like every other day. Don't you think you are just going to hear 
Ah, no. If you didn't hear it and you are remaining, it means you didn't make it. Look up. Let me teach you something. Laugh, but take it serious because it will happen. It's not a parable. Let me tell you what will happen. The Bible says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, please blink your eye for me. That's it. That is how fast it will happen. Repeat it again. Have you ever had an event so miraculous and so sudden? It didn't say in five minutes. In a moment, a twinkling of an eye, an event will happen on earth that has never been recorded. Billions of graves will open in a moment. Loved ones, some of them you have never seen them. All these people, these missionaries that died inside holes, water, all kinds of places. You would see a glorious transition, that resurrection. And the Bible says, we who are alive and remain, in a twinkling of an eye, it will look like we are all going together. And we will wave this version of earth goodbye with all the nonsense and all the wickedness and the fuel crisis and all the trouble that keep plaguing people on earth. Rejoice only if you are saved. Because I'm about to tell you the other side of the story. Listen carefully. The Bible says in that moment, I don't mean to scare you, but please listen to the other version. The greatest catastrophe more than World War II is what will be happening coincidentally because when about 2.6 billion people professing Christians exit this earth in a moment, what if the person exiting is the pilot flying you? What if the person exiting is the one responsible for some nuclear plant somewhere? You think they will wait for you? No. I mean what I'm saying. That moment, just like this, and that's it. You will see Bibles on earth. You will see him books left in churches. Unfortunately, there will still be many people in those buildings. And they will say, what has suddenly happened? The Bible says two people will be lying together. One will leave and leave the other one there. Others will be granting their thing to go and cook for their families. The other one will say, no more issue of cooking. I'm on my way going. And you will see that glorious exit. We will wave this version of earth goodbye. Do you know why? Because of the power of his resurrection. At that point, death will no longer have power over us. We will not live by blood again. No. The reign of living by blood ends. The moment that trumpet sounds, the ministry of blood in our lives would have come to an end. We will live by another life. The reality, the fullness of the earnest of that expectation, that, that ministry of the spirit, the culmination of that salvation experience happens. And we are with Jesus. And let me tell you this, I don't mean to scare you. It is that catastrophe on earth that will lead to the ministry of the Antichrist. Are you seeing now? The chaos in the earth will be too much. There will be a need for a religious and a political leader to bring the earth in peace. Because the chaos will be too much. Nations and governments will crumble overnight. And a world leader will come and say, find peace. His intelligence and his acumen, he will, he will bring a level of peace that you cannot imagine. And with that peace, the Bible says for a period of about three and a half years, and then he will unleash hell. Hell that will make World War II look like humanitarian services. I don't mean to scare you. This is the word of God. It's called written judgment. No prayer warrior can change it. All over the world and even in this place, you are listening to me. The resurrection is God's 
determination to see that we never end up in eternal damnation. Celebrating Easter by just eating chicken and jumping and saying, whoa, I'm happy, is a complete waste of that, that event. The ceremony of it is not where the power comes from. It is the commemoration of it. The commemoration of it means that you take to heart the significance of it. Someday, Jesus is going to come. What's that song in my spirit? Take it higher for me, please. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You've forgotten it. Sing it, oh. Hallelujah, he arose. Hallelujah, he arose, the Prince of Peace arose. Hallelujah, he arose, oh yes, oh yes. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, oh yes, oh yes. And hallelujah, he arose. Here is my question. When we all rise and this life is over as we know it, no more banks, no more universities, no more oil and gas, no more certificates, no more going to the mall to buy anything. All the terrorists will leave them there. I don't know who they will attack. Everything you've been trying to hide in your house, you're about to go and leave it. The pit you dug in your house to hide money, you will leave it there as you go. Can I tell you, I hate to be a bearer of bad news, but some of you, as you are now, you are not going. I'm not a prophet of doom. It is by the integrity of God's word. There are people who will laugh at us when they hear us say these things as though we're just doing some spiritual gibberish. Can I tell you, everybody in hell is a believer. The only difference is that they believe too late. I don't want to scare you with all the eschatological realities that will happen after this first flight. That all those who do not make this first flight, let me tell you what will happen. The Bible says because of the torture and the persecution that will happen, that people will go to the mountain and beg death. This death you are running away from now. People will look for it and death will say, my ministry is over. Mm, I've not, I'm, I can't. People will beg death when hell and everything to be unleashed will be unleashed. Now, listen, please. I didn't come just to scare you, nor did I come to flatter you and lie to you. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by I will fly away can I tell you this the question I want to ask is some of you will be on your way going and you will look down and you will see your biological mother behind some of you will get up and you are already, that power of resurrection is already in you. But you will turn and see all your siblings. They will say, what is happening? And you have to leave. For many people, it will be a service like this. 
Maybe it will even be a koinonia service. Just when I'm about to pick the mic and say hallelujah, the only thing you will see is your mic dropping on the ground. The fact that you can see it means you are in trouble. Can I tell you? Please look up. By the privilege of God's grace and by reason of what I do, I'm not a medical doctor, but I have stood before many dead bodies in my life. Many. I've been in a mortuary. I've been locked in a mortuary. Every time I look at a dead body, two things come to my mind. Number one, every dead body also saw a dead body in his lifetime. And now he is that dead body that others are looking at. Can I tell you this? Money will not resurrect you. Education will not resurrect you. Tithes and offerings will not resurrect you. Mm -mm. There is only one basis for the resurrection. Because he resurrected Jesus, he's given me the basis to know that in life and in death, death has been defeated spiritually and will be perfected at that last trump. Why did I come to teach you today? So that as you celebrate Easter, you only celebrate if that power of resurrection has been deposited in you by reason of acknowledging the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus and placing your faith. Now you can celebrate. You can enjoy and know that I thank God for what has happened to me. Ladies and gentlemen, for a long time we heard that Jesus is coming soon. And for many people, they are laughing, coming soon, 2,000 years. There are two ways Jesus comes soon. He comes or you go. The day you leave, Jesus has come for you. Let me repeat. I'm not scaring you. You will live long. But can I tell you, even if you live 120 years, which is the benchmark we're giving, you can stretch through. Right? But I assure you by God, even Lazarus, who Jesus raised, still died. Everybody who was raised from the dead still died. So it is not just the physical living in this body. I am the resurrection and I am the life. You can hear this preacher preaching and just laugh and say, wow, he's preaching well. On that day, when we leave, this sermon will be behind to teach you. Don't give your life to Christ under cruelty of the wickedness that will bedevil this world. When we are gone. Do you know what it means for the earth to be pitch darkness? The Bible teaches that the evangelists that will remain when we are gone are the Jews. Because everyone who names the name of Christ will be gone. And it is only some of them who although they came from Abraham do not believe this truth. They will now go back. The Bible will suddenly become the bestseller after rapture. Everyone will be looking for the Bible to check what else will happen. We laughed at this group of people, laughing at them and saying they were wasting their time. Everybody will pick Bibles free and have to read. And they will find it there. People will cry and wail and say, God, come back. They say, no, this second one, it will not just be by you dying and going. The trumpet has sounded, it has sounded. Go and read your Bible and see the torture that is going to happen to people on account of the Antichrist. Thrown through fire, going through all of this that you cannot buy or sell until you receive that mark on your forehead or on, on the, the side of your hands. And those who escape, they will go to the mountain and say, fall on us and it will not come. The only way out will be martyrdom. Now you have a chance, a cheap chance towards Jesus. I'm not scaring you. It's not a lie. It will happen. There is no point sugarcoating it. Ladies and gentlemen, it will happen. The Bible says, if our hope is only in this life, 
we are of all men most miserable. For Jesus to leave heaven and come and pay that price, he knows what is at the other side of that disobedience. My call for you tonight is, are you going to allow the work of the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, to just waste like that because of stubbornness and rebellion? Remember, the first thing that happened to man was disobedience. And the first thing that happened to Satan was rebellion. Do not allow a combination of rebellion and disobedience to separate you from him eternally. There are people who have been martyred because of this gospel. Church history is full of men and women who died believing in Jesus. I can tell you, even in death, they cheated death. My precious and wonderful mentor, Miles Munro. Sadly, he died through a plane crash. It was so disheartening. Why would he die through a plane crash? Until I realized that he always said it, that in death he would cheat death. It is only your body that goes. Can I tell you this? Those who die, huh? few minutes before their actual death, they don't feel any physical pain again. You are the only one sympathizing with the pain of the body. I can tell you this. Few minutes to their death, the power of this body and the pain thereof does not hold on them again. No matter how deteriorated the body is, that transition is happening. Unto life eternal or unto eternal damnation. Please look up. Let me tell you this. Anybody who dies without Jesus, there is no repentance again. There is no forgiveness again. I repeat, there is no repentance again. It is painful, but there are people who have died. There is no record in scripture that from the time Jesus died and resurrected, anyone who died had the gospel preached to them in hell. That happened before Jesus resurrected. Remember Lazarus, he cried a cry and said, please. What I want you to do is let somebody from this place rise up and enter the world and go to my family members and tell them, please, this thing is real. And hear the reply. He said, they have Moses and they have the law. If they don't listen to them, even if somebody comes out of the grave today, they will not listen to them. You don't have to wait until a dead body resurrects and tells you it is real. Here and there, there are people who have resurrected from the dead. Others have seen nonsense. What they have seen, we know from Scripture that that thing is not, it's not a revelation from Scripture at all. It's just divination. They were deceived. But there have been genuine encounters of people. For this promise is unto you and to your children. And listen to me. Don't sit back there saying, I'm happy I'm glad I belong to Jesus. If you are the only one who lives out of a family of 200 people and you are the only one who lives, you never got to tell them about Jesus. You know, in church, sometimes we are afraid of saying this other part because we say we don't want people. Let me tell you this. Being saved and being prepared for the resurrection is more than just trying to scare you. Jesus said when the spirit comes, he will reprove the world of three things. Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. I've not been to hell as a revelation. So I will not come here and say, oh, I wasn't, I've, not, I've seen demons, I've seen all kinds of wicked spirits. But I've not been given the privilege to go to hell to see it. But let me tell you the truth. The lake of fire, even hell, is real. Believers, at Easter, God mandates that we take a review, number one, of our lives and our destinies. Number two, we become active intercessors for those who are not saved. Because let me tell you, the catastrophe that happens when the church leaves, even your arch enemy, you will not want him to go through that kind of thing. Believe me. I told you that the catastrophe that will come to earth will make World War II look like humanitarian services. What then is the significance 
of Easter. Number one, it is a time of gratitude to God for this eternal escape from damnation. Gratitude to God for using his blood and his sacrifice on the cross to bring for us this eternal escape from damnation. Translating us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his eternal son. Number two. What is the significance of Easter? A moment of reflection. A moment of reflection. What does it mean to reflect? To think deeply. So that you continue to walk in the truths that you have received and so that you continue to guard jealously. In another teaching, I hope in one of the series before the year ends, we'll be able to deal with this issue. I hope I'll remember to bring it. Once saved, are you always saved? I will answer it during that series. And we'll hopefully bring to end the confusion of what we call eternal security or do you have to keep working out your salvation in both dimensions, I have had disastrous imbalances on both sides. And I trust that God will give us perspective to understand. And we'll be answering questions like, can a believer lose his salvation? If yes, what is the condition? Are we together? So, Easter is a moment of number one, thanksgiving. Number two, sober reflection. Number three, Easter should be a moment of active soul winning, active evangelism. One of the greatest ways to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to be sure to declare to someone, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus let me tell you, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am both old and new school. We have to be careful at some of these things we have thrown out. We have replaced some of these songs you see. I'm, I'm not talking about the songs. I'm talking about the ideas. The average believer today is not soul winning conscious. We are receiving conscious. Don't get me wrong. God wants to give us all things freely to enjoy. But the average believer is not evangelical in his thinking. Especially Pentecostals and Charismatics. Soul winning, zero. Our idea of soul winning, sadly and respectfully, for most people is just a strategy for addition of church membership. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. And there is nothing wrong with that. Because... Until you have membership, you cannot train and mentor them. The institution of the church is the only platform that is able to mentor and raise believers. If everyone seated looking at me now, covenants with God that to honor this Easter, Lord, I will bring you the gift of two souls, three souls. Think how many people would be saved just during this period. We used to sing a song those days. Please take it down for me so I don't shout. In Anglican. Must I go an empty hand? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty hand and go? Okay, Jesus Christ, I made it. What did you bring as a gift? Nothing. I brought myself. Be grateful that I am saved. You will become like that man with one talent who said, I know you are a hard man. You like reaping where you did not sow. It's not enough to be saved. You must ensure that through your life, imagine how many people will walk up to you in heaven and look at you and tap you and you say, who are you? You say you may not remember, but thank you for giving to the Lord. I am alive that was saved. 
Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you came. Listen, may it not be that that day you will turn and see your roommate. You will turn and see somebody you laugh with and ate with in your office for 10 years and never told the person about Jesus. The person drove you as a big man for 15 years, never heard about Jesus Christ. Apostle, but I, I don't want to fall my hand. I can tell you this, believe it or not, the worst one is that you see your family members. Can I tell you, nobody will be spared who does not have that software of the resurrection power of Jesus. That trump and moment, all of us in Christ will arise. For some of you, the Lord Jesus will tell you, remember that night in Koinonia, when my son was shouting, you laughed at the jokes, but when it was time for an altar call, you sat down. When my spirit was telling you, this is the moment of destiny. We will not be here forever. Whether we like it or not, that is the truth. Our goal is to live as long as our assignments demand. Serving the purposes of God and living victoriously. But can I tell you, you can have assurance today of salvation and you can tap into that resurrection power. There is such a doctrine of the resurrection. Our hope is not only in this life. I will pray for you to prosper always. I will pray for you to increase always. I will pray for you to do well always. But my greatest joy is not that you receive these things. My consolation should be at the back of your prosperity, at the back of your increase. You have settled it with God. And that power of resurrection dwells within you. And you know that whether in life or in death, you are victorious. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I stand. What height of love, what depth of peace. Till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ. I remember many years ago watching Reinhard Bonke on that crusade ground. I was already saved. But I watched him. I followed his ministry very carefully. And I saw times when he started getting old. I remember the last time he came for his crusade in Lagos. As though he knew it would be his last. The day they said he had gone, I said, my God, this man was once alive. And now he's gone. Hear me. There are people who were alive as of January this year. Some have gone. In fact, there were those who were alive yesterday. I will never mean you evil. And as far as my assignment is concerned, I will keep speaking life so that you will have that body healthy and prepared to leave your assignment. But can I tell you, it is not a wise way to fear death. The purpose of longevity is not the fear of death. The purpose of longevity is the time and the enablement to fulfill the purposes of God given to you. Look at me. I want you to kill the fear of death this night. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And if he comes, hallelujah, shine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, time to go. Revive us again. Before we pray, we're going to have three minutes of intercession. That will be our corporate gift as a ministry 
to the Lord Jesus at this Easter. To say, Lord, the least we can do is to intercede for the next two minutes for souls. But before we do that, I want to make an altar call. While you are still seated, there's no point playing games. Can I tell you, if you take seriously what I'm saying, God can give you a chance to make it right. I don't need to cajole you. No matter how stubborn your spirit is, the Holy Ghost must have penetrated it to tell you that this issue of life and destiny, this is it. You are saying, Apostle, while I'm seated here, I cannot say for sure that if I die today, it is heaven. There are others who are saying, if Jesus comes, I may be part of the many you are saying will be left behind. I don't mean to scare you, but listen to me. I'm going to count one to three. Give your destiny a chance. Win that war. Or you are saying, Apostle, I think I remember making this call. But as it is, my life has gone haywire. I came to church. I don't want to play games. I want you to run and come and stand here. Nobody will force you. But on that day, there used to be a song we used to sing before. Um, what's the song now? On the last day. On, on the last day. Only true believers shall be raptured on the last day. On the last day, only true believers shall be raptured on the last day. On the last day, only true. Can I tell you, if you know you are going to hell, run out and come and stand here. Don't do big manism for your eternal destiny. No, it is not a wise choice. Apostle, I'm not sure. Join them and be sure. There is such a thing called the assurance of salvation. Don't mind all the naysayers who are saying you are coming out. It's better to come out five times and be sure than to sit back in assumption and go to hell. Come to Jesus. Come to him. Once and for all, come to him. Everyone you see who is not coming out must have made this decision. So there is nothing embarrassing about it. If you are coming, all the overflows, please make sure you stand there. We are going to intercede. But I thought to do this so that I get it out of the way. Quickly, please come. Apostle, I've been going to church. I confess that I've been one of the people laughing at preachers. Don't worry, we forgive you. God loves you. Join them. Join them. You have to be saved. After this, you can now say, Happy Easter. And really believe what you are saying. There is nothing happy about the Easter to a soul that is determined to be damned. Thus will we part from the earth and its toiling. Only remember by what we have done. Come, I'll give you one more minute. I know there are so many people, but there is still room. There is still room. Come to Jesus. And those of you who are sitting, you shouldn't be looking. You should be praying. Because we are, from this altar call now, we are going to get into praying just five minutes. If you cannot invest five minutes of your intercessory ministry for souls, you are not a lover of God. There's no need hurrying anywhere. I want to pray. Listen to me. Those of you who are here, please look at me. The idea is not to scare you. But the idea is to leave you with the truth. Jesus died and rose. You took all my guilt and shame when you died and rose again. Now today you reign in heaven and earth exalted. I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have won my heart and I am yours forever and ever. 
I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to set me free. So I lift my voice to you in adoration. May I please request, I know that there are so many of you, some of you are crying. There's no need to cry. Someday, because of this decision you have made, we will have another kind of coin on here. Not in this place. Do you know there is another fellowship? I know there is another fellowship in heaven. Lift your right hand. Please say after me, all of you. You may cry, but say it. Jesus is here. Let him hear you. In one minute, please say after me from the depth of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight just as I am, unable to help myself. I have heard your word tonight. I need you. Say it again. I need you in my life. I need the power of resurrection in my spirit. I confess you as my Savior, the one who died for me, as my Lord, the one my allegiance is towards, and as my King, the governor of my destiny. I receive eternal life into my spirit. And I declare that as Jesus defeated sin, the grave, death, and hell, I also, by this confession, I declare my, my victory over sin, over hell, over death, over the grave. I declare that I have eternal life. The resurrection power now lives within me. I am a child of God, victorious on earth, and victorious even after this life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let me pray for you. Father, by their confessions of faith, I decree and declare that indeed they not only have salvation, but they have the assurance of salvation. Let nothing ever pluck them from your hand. In the name of Jesus. Lord, you will save them. You will keep them. You will establish them. Now I pray for you, the fear of death and doubt whether you belong to Jesus or not. I command that thought to live your destiny forever. Let me remind you that you are not saved just by what you have done. No man is able to save himself by the works of the law. It is vanity and it is vain. You are only saved because you believe in this reality. That Jesus came, he walked upon the earth, he died, went to hell, defeated hell, death, sin, and the grave, resurrected triumphantly, and now he lives and abides forever. Now hear me please, ladies and gentlemen, let me encourage you, make up your mind to continue to pursue that which makes for your spiritual establishment, even as you have done. The house of God is where we are built, where we are established. It's not just going to church like coming to be a member of a church. It is more than that. It is being planted in the house of God so that you will flourish in the courts of our God. Now, there are a number of you, um, and I know that a number of you are rededicating your lives to Christ, I presume. Counselors, you can manage both sets. Those who are making their decision the first time, you can group them so you spend more time. Those who are rededicating their lives because of the crowd, I'm not sure that because we have to get into a prayer session now. So you can just pray so that they can return back to their seats. There are so many people and so that it can ease up the work for the counselors. Our focus primarily now, as far as follow-up is concerned, is those who are saved for the first time. So let me encourage you as you go, those who are, this is the first time you are making this decision. It's an opportunity for you. They will ask you to be grouped somewhere else. Please move there so they can just speak a word of prayer for those who are rededicating their lives and then they rush back. Are we together? But for now, may I request that you please move to my 
right, which is your left. Let's celebrate them, a number of them. Okay, we are splitting into two, right from where I'm standing. All those who are here, please go this way, and then the remaining go that way. Thank you. We're helping to manage because of the number of people. Let's celebrate them as they go. Hallelujah. Now, our time is up. In the next five minutes, we are going to, is, this is our corporate gift tonight to the Lord Jesus. I want you to think of at least two or three people you know who are not saved. It could be your loved ones. It could be someone. And let's cry as a family of faith and say, Lord, they will not go to hell. Not when we are here. If you don't have anyone to pray for, pray in the spirit. Please pray. There has to be someone in your life. Some relative somewhere. Some unbeliever somewhere. And those of you who are viewing, following, here is your chance to intercede. Pray for someone's eternal destiny. Lord, that they will not be lost. Don't be tired. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we decree and declare from the north to the south, east to the west, we pray for the unreached, we pray for the unsaved, we pray for missionaries, we pray for men and women who are out there in the field crying for souls in the name of Jesus strengthen them Lord we pray that you save to the uttermost as a global family of faith we bring to you as a gift our intercession over the lost Lord save them we release angels bring them to the foot of the cross pray for your father pray for your mother pray for your brothers and sisters pray for your colleagues in the office pray let a fire of salvation engulf Africa Nigeria, Europe pray for Europe pray for America pray for these regions that seem to be losing out in many ways Lord revive them Please pray. Lord, we pray for salvation. We pray for salvation. We intercede for the lost. Bring them to the foot of the cross. In the name of Jesus, we decree and declare that the power of resurrection will catch up with them. That they may know Jesus. They will pledge their lives and their days to your Lordship. Lord, we intercede in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Let me add one more prayer point. This one will be to you now. You are going to pray and say, Father, the power of resurrection, let it speak in my life right now. Total victory. Lift your voice and pray. The culmination of it will be when the trumpet blasts. But there are measures of it that have been given unto us to experience right now. Go ahead and pray. The power of resurrection, it must work in my life. That power that raised Christ from the dead. Someone is praying. That I may know you and that I may walk in the power of your resurrection. The power of resurrection, bringing life and vitality to my body. The power of resurrection, keeping me alive all through the moments of my assignment. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Last prayer point. Everything dead in my destiny, because he arose, I command you by the power of resurrection. Arise now. Open your mouth and begin to pray. My health that is dead or dying, arise now. Is someone praying? Because he arose from the grave, everything locked up in the grave, finances, opportunities, my destiny, I command you by the power of resurrection, like Lazarus, come forth. New doors that will give me an opportunity to serve his majesty come forth go ahead and declare please pray please pray please pray make meaning of your easter because he arose i decree and declare I arise spiritually, I arise financially, I arise destiny-wise, I arise. And every power of the grave, every power of the grave, every grave cloth over my life, every grave cloth over my ministry, are you praying? Every grave cloth over my family, my children, pray. I command you, give way right now. I lose those grave clothes. If he arose, then I arise. If he arose, then I arise. Pray over every challenge in your life. Financial challenges, health challenges. Because he arose, I arise. Refuse to remain in the grave. He is risen. The doctrine of resurrection demands that like he arose, you also arise. Same power that conquered the earth lives in me ah, lives in me your love that rescued the earth lives in me ah, lives in me prophesy over your destiny same power that conquered the earth lives in me Your love, your love, your love, 
Listen, I want to prophesy and declare and activate that power of resurrection. Now that you are still alive, there are still other things that are dead. And you can't be alive and something around your life is now dead. I want to speak, believe it, that in the name of Jesus, dead finances, let the power of resurrection cause you to come back to life now. Dead relationships come back to life now. Dead opportunities come back to life now. Dead health conditions. Hear me. Anyone here who is sick in your body and the devil is already trying to see that he deteriorates your body, I command that dead organ to come back to life now. Dreams, dreams that God gave you, but for some reason they have died. It comes back to life now. <laughs> Giftings, abilities that have died, that God gave you to bring you increase, to bring you significance. I decree and declare they come back to life now. I hear me anyone wearing any grave clothes in the realm of the spirit by the power that raised Christ from the dead I lose you now go free 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 in the name of Jesus hear me any family here represented that has a loved one that is not saved we release angels to those houses. We release angels to those houses. Supernatural encounters through dreams and visions in the name of Jesus Christ. Hear me, please. Anyone having dreams of untimely death, you keep seeing yourself with dead people. You keep seeing yourself dreaming. Or maybe prophetic words have been coming. Be careful. I see you dying. I want to declare to you, by reason of the power of death, nothing takes you until your assignment is over. I repeat, nothing takes you until your assignment is over. Two more prayers. Everyone here under the yoke of the spirit of fear, you can't live your life freely because you are afraid. What if I go out and I die? What if I come and I die? What if I take a plane and it crashes? What if I go by road and something happens? I command that spirit of death that comes through fear to live your life now. In the name of Jesus. The works of your hands, whatever has died, hear the word of the Lord. I bring to you the resurrection power. Hear me. If the grave could not stop Jesus from coming back to life, I transport anything that needs to come from the realm of the spirit into this physical realm. By the resurrection power, let it appear in your physical realm here. Hear me, if Jesus could live one dimension into another, then every blessing that you need locked up in the realm of the spirit, I pull it down to manifest in the physical realm. In the name of Jesus, 
Say after me very loud and clear. Say in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that I am a child of God. Born of the word and born of the spirit. I believe that Jesus walked upon the earth. I believe he died. I believe he was buried. I believe he went to the place of the dead. I believe he defeated Satan, sin, hell, and the grave. I believe he resurrected by the glory of the Father. I believe that he ascended to heaven. I believe he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for me. I believe that I am victorious in this life and hereafter. No more fear, no more limitations, no more anxiety. I am victorious today and victorious always. Give Jesus a big shout of praise. Hallelujah. The Bible says, the righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise. I want you to go back home today carrying that consciousness. I am victorious. Don't let life bully you. In life you are victorious. Beyond it you are victorious. If he rose, you will rise. On that day, but for now, everything connected to you must rise to match up what has happened. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hold hands together, final prayer, and then we're done. I am serving a living God. His name is Jesus Christ. He died and rose and gave me victory. I have victory. One more time from the depth of your heart. I am serving a living God. His name is Jesus Christ. He died. He died and rose and gave me victory. Now I can tell you, happy Easter. Happy Easter means a victorious Easter. That you commemorate with understanding that you are a victor and you remain a victor forever. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.